Ipman opposes Tinubu subsidy removal plan. Q's return. Even as experts say it is a good move, is Nigeria really ripe for the abrupt removal as it was done? We'll interrogate that on the show this morning. There was a huge cry that the last administration exceeded the limit in borrowing by ways and means. Instead of finding ways to correct it and make sure it doesn't happen again, the Senate has now increased federal government's borrowing from 5 to 15% through ways and means. Is that a boon or a bane for our economy? That also will be interrogated on the program this morning. And of course, we'll have headlines from the newspaper dailies and what is everyone talking about today. That's on Off the Press. A very good morning to you and thanks for joining us on The Breakfast on PLOS TV Africa. My name is Nyamgul Agaji. Uh, unfortunately, today I'm home alone as it is. If you grew up and watched that um, movie, you would know what I'm talking about. But I'm not alone, actually. I might be alone here in the studio, but I know that I have you there uh, watching us right now. And I'm so glad to have you join us this morning. As usual, we are just uh, going to talk about the things that are happening, the things that are trending right now, and also uh, give you some updates on some of the things that we have already discussed. I'm sure wherever you are today, the traffic situation is a little bit different from what it was yesterday, but relatively, it's very, very free. What is the problem right now is not actually um, traffic congestion, but the people congestion, because a lot of people cannot find vehicles to board. No buses are applying, not as many buses and vehicles are applying the roads because of uh, what happened after the pronouncement that fuel subsidy has been removed by the present administration. Uh, the uh, fares have gone up. Everything concerning commuting uh, in Lagos and everywhere else that we've had the privilege of getting information from has gone up. Uh, some fuel st filling stations were uh, selling fuel at 500 naira per litre, some at 600 naira. At least in Calabar, we know that uh, a few filling stations were selling as high as 600 naira, just from 180 naira to 600 naira within a space of maybe five hours it rose like that so a lot of people were not prepared for that those the people who even uh, went to abuja for the uh, ceremony for this swearing in ceremony the inauguration ceremony uh, who had to go by road especially uh, came back with uh, double the, the fare that they paid to Abuja. So let's say you're paying 15000 to take a, 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 a car to Abuja. When you're coming back, you're paying nearly 30000 naira to come back. Because people are panic buying, people are panic selling, if, if that is allowed to be used. Because you do not know, if subsidy is removed, you do not even know what the, um, the price will be the landing price will be and if you need to stay in business i'm trying to play devil's advocate now and understand with the sellers of this uh, commodity you do not even know if the next time it's being sold to you they will sell it at triple the price so which means if you're selling to uh, the people at the approved pump price it may be that when the time comes when you need to restock you might have to borrow some money. So a lot of people may be uh, just guarding against that and trying to save for the rainy day. I know that it's, it's very tight on all of us, but you know, whoever gives the opportunity to criminals in court to do what they're not supposed to do is the one that we should hold responsible for whatever is happening. So if our government has come, a proactive government that it is trying to show us that it is going to be, um, maybe they should guard against some of the pronouncements until the things are right and everybody is sure. We hear that there's been uh, some explanation that the subsidy will not be removed right away and all that. But those that have heard that it has been removed have heard that it has been removed. And we know already that it has been removed. 
uh, whatever palliative measures that were put in place for that to be done uh, is what we were not told. If we, if the president has just told us that fuel subsidy stands removed, but in the meantime, this is what is going to happen, X, Y, Z is going to happen, and so nobody should panic, uh, whether the sellers or the buyers, nobody should panic. Maybe it would have doused the tension a little bit, but he didn't say that. He just said, according to what I was told, there is no provision in the budget for the fuel subsidy, so it stands removed. Uh, so to a lot of people, that was an excuse that it's the previous administration that did this and he just supports them or his hands are tied. But, you know, this thing has been talked about for a very long time and before he was handed over to, I'm sure they must have briefed him, this is what is going to happen. We th felt that he should have had a, a game plan, he should have had a, a plan B to say, okay, fuel subsidy, I have the political will to remove it, but now that I've removed it, or now that it has been removed, these are the measures that Nigerians should look out for uh, because we have put this in place to make sure that um, the, the effect is not felt that much. Okay, but, you know, so for whoever is going to work uh, today, I wish you well. I wish you a safe journey. I wish you, I wish you a bus or a car. You know, you can actually wish someone like that, that you wake up and you get the transportation to come to work or to go to work. You get the means to get to work. Some people have the money, but they don't find the vehicles. The crowd in, on the roads is, uh, uh, is massive. I don't know if it has thinned by now, but when I was coming to work, the crowd was massive. Uh, so if you are in that crowd, that means there'll be a lot of fighting <laughs> to get into cars. Some cars might be broken. I've seen situations where people are struggling to enter cars and they rip off the, the doors or the, the side mirrors or something uh, in the cars and all that. So let this never happen. It used to happen in those days where people were rushing to enter the Molue and all that. Up until 2005, where when I, as a person, came to Lagos for the first time, there was that rush and, you know, it was too crazy for me. It was too fast forward for a city for me. But Lagos is gradually having some kind of order. Let us continue with this order by making sure the policies that are brought uh, to the people uh, will not be such that it takes us back 10, 20 years ago uh, from what we are enjoying right now. Well, yesterday or the day before, a few hours away from here, we, we heard uh, where there was a scuffle between the DSS and the EFCC. And the DSS came out and said that there was no, there was no contest between them and the EFCC. Uh, so they, it was about the office uh, that um, they had blocked the EFCC officials from entering the office and a lot of things were said. And the DSS came out and said, that office belongs to them. It has always been their office and uh, they have no problems with the EFCC. So they just went to work in their office. And we were asking ourselves, I was asking myself, if you, the office has been yours from a long time ago till now, uh, how come it's on the news that there was a problem? What, there's no smoke without fire. And then we woke up to the realization, according to the news, that the president has asked the DSS to vacate that premises. So if the premises belong to the DSS like they claimed, and now they have been asked to go, actually, the question is, where are they going to? Has the president made um, a, 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 any alternative arrangements for the DSS to, to move? and leave the EFCC office, as, as they have put it in the news, because if it belonged to the DSS and now they are the ones to move, which means they had no plan. But if it belonged to the DSS and he had asked the EFCC to move, maybe we will understand that they may have been having some plans that one day this might come. So what plans does uh, or what plans do the present administration have uh, to accommodate DSS. Are they going to look for accommodation now? Did they provide any other accommodation and all that? There are some of the details that even though uh, we have them, but they're still not very clear. So we'll, we are as good as saying that we do not have those kind of details. But we do hope that a very critical agency of government like the DSS must not uh, be homeless even for a day. So whatever the measures are, that's the news now that Tinubu, the president, President, uh, I nearly said Muhammad Buhari, <laughs> it's just a few days away, President Bola Ahmed Tinubu has ordered DSS to vacate the EFCC office immediately. 
not um, in a matter of months, not in a matter of weeks, but immediately. And when it is said immediately, that means immediately. So even if there are appointments made and they say it takes immediate effect, that means that day that the appointments were made, it takes effect from that day to start work that day. So immediately uh, means there's urgency. They have to leave. Wherever they are going to is what we do not understand if they have an alternative accommodation. Um, we, we also have another thing um, that is uh, happening or has happened. The National Industrial Court has upheld federal government's no work, no pay policy. No work, no pay policy means that for the months that uh, ASU, for instance, um, went on strike, they will not earn a salary. Yeah, well, maybe the law says that. Um, I don't know how the law really operates, if it has a human face or it doesn't. Well, we see from the statute that the face is covered, so it has no regard for anybody. Everybody is equal before the law. But I'm just asking, I'm wondering as a layman that doesn't know the law that much, and I'm not in the corridors of power, that if ASU goes for, uh, on strike for like eight months and they come back from that strike, and you don't pay them for the strike, the period of the strike. If they decide that they will not visit anything in the curriculum for those eight months that were lost, um, will they also be held responsible or accountable? Will they also be held to pay for that time? Because if I didn't work for eight months and I come back from the eight months uh, strike, and I cover the work that I was supposed to do for all those eight months, uh, will you still say that I didn't work for eight months? I'm just trying to make sense out of it. But even then, having said this, that the, federal the courts have upheld this, uh, because federal government had dragged ASU before the NIC, National Industrial Court, over the demand of the union for the payment of their salaries from February 14 to October 7. 2022, when the strike was called off. Uh, the policy is tantamount to breach of labor rights. That's according to the um, uh, NLC, uh, Nigerian Labor Congress. Also, another opinion says that it breaches the spirit of collective bargaining, the power of labor unions to negotiate on behalf of other members. Uh, there's another, a third opinion which says that calling for strike is a part of negotiation strategy and uh, all that, those opinions have come up, but uh, the, 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 high, the court still held that it is a violation of university autonomy. Uh, on the other hand, that it's a violation of the university autonomy for the federal government to impose um, the, uh, the integrated payroll and personal, personnel information system, the IPPS, the IPPIS platform on members of ASU who reserve the right to determine how their salaries should be paid. That's the only thing that the courts upheld, that the, the ASU, the striking lecturers, uh, should never be um, forced to be on the integrated uh, payroll that we're, we're, they were kicking against. They said they had their own model uh, that they were comfortable with. And the federal government was saying, no, you must belong to the IPPIS because that is the universal one we have chosen for everybody. So you must have to be on it. Uh, but the court said, no, you can't compel them to be part of that IPPIS. So you let them choose their method of payment that they are comfortable with. But they, they, they went ahead and said that uh, they should not be paid because that's what the law says. So I just put out the question there, whoever is a lawyer, uh, whoever is of a legal mind should uh, try to explain to us, maybe today or by calling us or sending to our social media platform so that we can also tell the public because we stand confused. I stand confused because I was given a portion to clear and I went away. I didn't clear it. I come back. You say you're not going to pay me. And then I still go ahead and clear that portion of grass. And then you say that because I went away, I violated the rule. And the rule was, if I don't work, I don't pay. But I've done the work. Why would you not pay me for the work I've done? So I think it's dangerous for our children who are in school, for ourselves who want to uh, continue to be in school, for the educational system, where you say that if someone is aggrieved and he feels that 
he should come to the table and talk with you. The grouse of ISU was that they talked with the government and they failed to do what they were, going, what they were supposed to do for years maybe 1999 or 2009 or so, for years it has gone on like that. And their option was to go on strike, which also is supposed to be their right. So if there is a no work, no pay, what if they decide not to do the work for which they are not being paid? How will that fare? How will the educational system fare? I'm just thinking aloud as an individual. So the courts have already ruled. Maybe there's no going back on that. But if we think about it, it's either we'll have the political will or the, the discipline or the whatever word you want to use it to make sure that we stand by our words. If, see, as a government, you make promises you have to fulfill or at least renegotiate and get a, a, a central ground or a middle ground, as they say. But if you, nothing is being done and then you come up with the sanctions because the law says X, Y, Z, if the law is interpreted by those same people who are now the victims and they want to do according to how the law says, I don't know how we will fare, our educational system will fare and all that. We should think about it. So the new administration has come. The new administration has promised that youths will be an integral part of this administration. Uh, ICT will be a part of it. The women also will be a part of this administration. We are yet to see how that will play out. But if you're talking youths, you talk education as well. If these youths that you think should be an integral part of this government are deprived, a set of them are deprived of the education that will enable them be the drivers of our economy tomorrow, the drivers of our political sphere tomorrow, the drivers of everything that we need as a nation tomorrow, then how good is this? It's as if you're taking that portion of our, our population that is ready now and saying, I don't care about what happens to the next generation that is supposed to take over from this one. So this present administration should do something about it and think very hard before they slam sanctions on any aspect of our economy. And please, maybe when they're thinking about ministers and people to superintend over that Minister of Education, they should think of people who already know something about the ministry or about the sector because the, the last minister said when he was appointed there was nothing he knew about the, the educational system and so uh, possibly some of the blunders that he made were because he knew nothing about it. So this situation where we sent ministers, uh, a list of ministers to the uh, Senate or to the National Assembly, ministers that do not know what they will become, you send a lawyer to become, uh, to be in interviewed by the Senate to be asked the questions by the Senate and then they're asking him questions as a lawyer. You come and give him a Minister for Agriculture. You send someone who is supposed to be <laughs> um, a businessman and you're thinking that he's going to be Minister of Finance or something close to that and then you're giving that person Minister of Education or, or something else that is not related to business or finances and all that. So. Let's know people who are going to be heads of whatever ministries that we are going to have. Send them to the Senate according to the kind of portfolios that they should have. That's, that's an opinion that a lot of people have expressed also as well anyway. So let the Senate know what is on their minds and then see if they are good enough for the positions for which they have been presented uh, that day. And also to the Senate or the, the National Assembly, please stop making them take a bow. Let's... Let Nigerians hear what their minds are, how their minds run, what kind of policies they think they, you think they can uh, bring to bear when they, when, they, when they actually get the portfolio that they are, they are going to get or they are supposed to get. Let, let us know the kind of person that is going to lead what sector and know how we can help or whatever we can suggest as well. Because when the people know that these are your weaknesses, these are your strengths, we know already what is coming up. And so when people are doing agitations, when people are, are making suggestions, when people are talking about your ministry, they know what to talk about. Because this is a democracy, and the beauty of a democracy is that everybody has a voice. That is what should be called dividends of democracy. Not building a road, not building a bridge, not building a school. That's part of governance that even the military administration can do.
when you go to Dubai, who is the president of Dubai? When you go to the places that are ruled by kings and queens, they still do these things, and even more than democratically elected um, uh, people, presidents and governors and all that. So that is part of governance. It's not anything to do with democracy. But democracy, the beauty of it is representation. We are able to say something. We are able to talk to the government. We are able to tell them what we want. We are able to tell them how we want to be governed. We are able to suggest a lot of things. And we are part of the government. That is democracy. Government of the people, by the people, and for the people. Well, we've been talking much about this, and we don't know what your opinion is about uh, what is happening. We first of all talked about the fact that uh, um, DSS has to vacate the premises of EFCC and all that. Um, the, and then we've talked about what the courts have said about no work, no pay. We also, we also know that uh, governors were sworn in on the uh, 29th of May. A lot of them have been very, uh, have shown that they were ready for the, uh, for the position. Abia State Governor has appointed so many people and we know that he has hit the ground running. Well, you know, the program will continue with a lot of other things that we need to discuss. Um, uh, off the Press will be coming up next after uh, the weather report that we are going to take right now. So just stay with us and don't go away.